you, John, and um, thank you all for who are in the room and those who are online um, for coming. I want to thank ONAP especially for hosting us today um, and for many of the collaborating agencies um, who participated in and supported the listening project since its inception um, in late 2005. Um, as many of you know, after a year after the Asian tsunami, um, C CDA um, initiated the listening project, and as John mentioned, the the tech actually li used, I think, the early the Aceh listening exercise, which Peter was on, um, as one of the, the references um, in that study. And it, it's interesting that, that some of the things that that called for are still what we're, what we're finding today. Um, and given the many years of international uh, assistance and the broad experience of a lot of us um, in this endeavor, we thought it was really a timely a timely to undertake a systematic um, and inclusive approach um, to, un to talk to people who are on the receiving side of our efforts and to hear what they say about the process um, and how, how it affects them and their societies. Um, as, as Peter alluded to, this was a hugely collaborative effort, um, far more, I think, extensive in some ways than, than any project we'd undertaken before. Um, we had over 130 international and local aid agencies um, were involved in the listening process and that we just facilitated. So a staff of aid agencies went out and did the listening with us. And over 100 or more were involved in the analysis through these feedback workshops of the evidence that we gathered. Um, through the listening project, we organized 20, uh, had listening exercises in 20 countries and together with aid workers, um, many of whom were staff of all that members, we listened to the ideas, the judgments, and the analyses of over 6,000 people. And in each country, we were there typically about, uh, we spent about a week in the field just listening, which for many of the staff who were involved just said this was an absolute luxury. For many people, this was the first chance they'd had to really just step back and listen and have conversations with people that they'd never had before about the cumulative and sort of long-term effects of, of their work. Well, most of the people that we talked to um, had received humanitarian assistance at some time, we weren't exclusively focused on humanitarian aid efforts, but on all types of assistance. Um, in fact, most of the people don't make the distinctions between different types of assistance that we as aid providers do, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. The system that they describe and, and the way that they interact with it is, is quite similar. There are some differences, but um, uh, for the most part, a lot of their responses were, were the same. We listened to a wide range of people, people who had benefited or were directly involved with aid efforts and government officials, civil society members, um, people in markets, uh, local leaders, business, business people, um, and other observers of international aid efforts. And we asked people to reflect on what were the long-term, the cumulative effects of being on the recipient side of international assistance, often for many years. And, and for many people, they had received or been involved with or observed a lot of different kinds of assistance, lots of different agencies, lots of different kinds of projects. Um, and so we were asking them just, you know, at the end of the day, what does it all add up to? What difference did it make? What approaches worked? What didn't, um, how did it feel being on the recipient end of this? And we listened to their experiences and their analyses of both the positive and negative effects um, and also asked them what should be done differently. So the stories that they told and the analysis that was done by them and with aid workers is, is what I'm really gonna dig into today. So what did we hear? Um, First, I have to say that I was, I've been in the field a long time, um, and I was really surprised at the consistent descriptions of the international aid system across very different contexts and geographical locations and social strata. People's, everywhere people described very similar experiences with the processes of international aid efforts, and they explained how these processes often undermine the goals of assistance. And in places that were as different as um, Zimbabwe to <coughs> Myanmar, um, Angola, East Timor, people had a very, very similar experiences with, um, with the aid agencies, and you really could just switch out the logo. It didn't really matter um, um, who they had engaged with, that they often had very, very similar experiences. Um, and the, as I said, there wasn't a lot of difference between humanitarian um, and development assistance. Um, they Some distinctions in the programming, but not a, a huge um, difference. Overall, we found that international aid is a good thing and that it's appreciated, which the tech found. Um, the second is that assistance as it now is provided is not achieving its intent. Um, the third, that fundamental changes are, must be made in how aid's provided if it's to be effective, and that these changes are both possible and doable. So today, today I'm going to describe eight aspects of the current um, externally driven aid delivery system and the type of collaborative aid system that people on the receiving end of international assistance um, want. Um, for those of you with the book, um, and here's a copy for those um, at <laughs> the end. I can, I'll explain how to get it. Um, it's on page 138. Um, uh, it, there's a chart that just sort of lays out these, what the current aid system looks like and what, um, 
uh, the future could look like. Um, but I'll describe each of those in, in turn. So first of all, in the externally driven aid delivery system, local people are seen as beneficiaries and recipients. As a policeman in Thailand said, there was too much assistance too fast, and international agencies should be slower in their distribution. People should help themselves first and only request and receive assistance when they cannot help themselves. By giving out so easily, you are turning them into beggars. Some villages receive too much to stop and think of the value of all the things that they have been given. And this was in the following the, um, the tsunami in the, in the southern part of Thailand. So this was in a humanitarian context. Um, the arrival of assistance does send a positive message that people care. And people appreciate the solidarity that it represents and the good intentions, intentions of those providing assistance. They're especially appreciative when aid has saved their lives and when it helps them to achieve their goals. But too often, people describe how cumulatively, over time, with project after project, the way aid is provided fuels dependency and powerlessness. They talk about a growing number of actors involved in providing assistance and often question their motivations. And they talk about how aid has become a business that is more concerned with its survival than with their development. And they talk about how things could be different. Um, as a Karen leader on the Thai Burma border refugee camp said, it's unavoidable that humanitarian aid created a situation where we are programmed to receive. If aid wasn't just given, but if there was a program that was much more of a give and take, it would be more beneficial for the whole community. It's important not to get things for free so that people are not programmed to get aid. If you give it for free, you take away the sense of responsibility that they had. Now, in a, in a collaborative aid system, people say that they would be seen as colleagues and drivers of their own development. They wouldn't just be seen as recipients and as beneficiaries. A second point, in the current externally driven um, aid delivery system, we focus on identifying needs. As a person uh, in Kabul said, NGOs look at immediate needs, but may not be aware of why there's a problem. Why is the child sick? They need to stay longer to get an idea of the real problems. People describe how international aid has become a massive, multi-layered, and complex delivery system that's focused on providing things, material goods, services, training, techniques, concepts, ideas, structures, even values, from the donor to recipients, based on assumptions of what is needed. In recent years, years the aid system has increasingly become the focus on improving the efficiency of delivery by developing policies and procedures to streamline and standardize the identif identification of needs, the modes of financing, the packaging of assistance, the ways to interact and communicate with recipient communities, the tracking of deliveries, and the monitoring and evaluation of the use of funds. So is that a problem? Yes, because according to those who are meant to be supported by international aid efforts, the focus on efficient delivery of things from providers to recipients, standardized through widely adopted policies and procedures, <coughs> does not, people say, bring the results that international assistance attend, intends and that they seek. So why is that? One of the reasons is that because a focus on delivery puts the programmatic focus on what is needed or seen to be missing rather than on what already exists or is working. When an agency is good at delivering good certain goods or services, it looks for people who need them and for places that, ask that lack them. The starting point for a relationship with this is, is its relationship with a, so with a society is a focus on needs assessment rather than on existing strengths and capacities. However, meeting a need does not necessarily solve the problem that produces this need, and if the assistance is not connected to existing capacities, it can undermine them. So unless the problem is solved and existing capacities are strengthened, the need may rise again. And we see this a lot in the humanitarian sector, where we're, we're responding over and over again to sometimes the same types of crises, because if we haven't actually really built and strengthened the local capacities that existed. I, it's, it's good to see it as we, as we move in the resilience, so, sort of talking about resilience more, that that, that should be the aim, but we, we still have quite a ways to go. Now for a business, this makes sense. Repeat customers provide a steady, steady <coughs> revenue base, but for international aid agencies, a needs focus perpetuates dependency rather than supporting self-reliance and lasting development. We all know this, and yet the system remains the same. So in a collaborative aid system, we would focus on supporting or reinforcing capacities and identifying local priorities and not just looking at needs. Third, in the, in, in the externally driven aid delivery system, we use pre-planned and predetermined programs. As a teacher in Kenya said, quite often donors assume they know every problem and therefore prescribe a solution. 
While we've made progress in pre-positioning humanitarian assistance to reach people faster, these physical warehouses are paralleled by well-stocked digital libraries of proposal and reporting templates. How many times do we go to our computers, warehouses of ideas and language as we start new projects and new contexts? This is what people mean when they talk about aid coming to them pre-packaged. Pre-planned and pre-packaged projects are intended to improve efficiency. They help us to respond quicker. And businesses realize economies of scale when they distribute standard products in multiple markets. However, when aid supplies the suppliers make the plans without the involvement of people in the area where the activity is to occur, their assistants can ignore local people's capacities and priorities. They may deliver the wrong things at the wrong time or in the wrong way, and many local people comment on how this often happens and how wasteful and therefore inefficient it is. If a business were to, su were to supply customers with unwanted products or services, it would find no market and would have to adapt its production or cease to exist. However, aid agencies can continue to supply unwanted goods or services that they as providers determine to be needed without apparent penalty so long as they can sell their ideas to their donors. Now, local people and aid workers alike talked about how the current project cycles and the funding procedures don't really provide them with the time and the resources to ensure that local people are fully engaged in the assessments and in the analysis and the design of programs that build on their resources and meet their self-defined needs and, and aspirations. People are under a lot of pressure, and they're just under pressure to do things quickly. Um, and they ha feel like they're constantly having to cut corners. The increased focus on prevention and resilience today should require that aid agencies better understand what local capacities exist and how to strengthen them in appropriate ways that won't undermine their long-term goals of self-sufficiency and development. As an aid worker in Senegal said, donors need to be honest and forthright about what they mean by participation. Is it simply a consultation with communities to get approval or support for a project that has already been predetermined, or really to decide jointly and to work together? So in a collaborative aid system, we would have context-relevant programs that would be developed jointly by recipient <coughs> communities and aid providers. <coughs> Fourth, in the externally driven aid delivery system, aid providers drive the decision making. As a local government official in Sri Lanka said, participatory planning is just a phrase. Money and time are limited from the donor side, and an agenda has already been set long before agencies go into communities. When we pursue efficiency in the delivery of aid, we develop procedures to support streamlining. We codify processes in order to facilitate quick responses, planning, and decision making. And donors, both funders and operational aid agencies, who are seen as one and the same by a lot of aid recipients, develop procedures for good reasons. Procedures provide predictability and consistency. They enable an agency to ensure that its staff work according to professional standards, rather than relying on ad hoc and personal biases to get things done. They provide a degree of transparency so that even those outside an agency can see what is expected and done by an agency. And this, of course, supports accountability. So there's good reasons and good purposes behind the many procedures that we've put in place. But the evidence from the people who live in recipient societies, however, shows that procedures have often turned in on themselves. Providers and recipients talk about how procedures take too much time, they're inflexible, they are too complicated, or they're counterproductive. Many talk about ways that the sort of tick-the-box processes become so dominant that aid organizations and workers lose sight of the very values and principles that these processes were meant to support. Proceduralization, it's kind of a yucky term, but we came up with it to talk about um, the, the, the how these procedures have really um, undermined uh, the, the original intent of the values and the principles. Um, it's meant to mirror the word bureaucratization, which refers to the process by which a large bureaucracy is developed to enable the accomplishment of, the accomplishment of complex jobs. It becomes so rigid that instead of accomplishing and facilitating the work that's intended to do, it becomes a barrier to the, uh, the achievement of its mission. People who become procedurecrats, another kind of nasty word, mm -hmm. uh, get so mired in the complexity and detail of procedural mm -hmm. compliance, often in the form of paperwork and reports, that they lose sight of the purposes of international assistance, and they equate effectiveness with filling out the forms, getting the reports in on time, and gaining another round of funding. From the listening project, we heard so many people at so many levels describe the procedures in the current aid delivery system as posing barriers to the achievement of its effective work, rather than facilitating it, that we had to recognize that many parts of our international assistance system have become proceduralized. 
The procedures we develop for good reasons are, are too often not helping us to achieve the goals that they were intended to support. Let me give you an example. In our current um, aid delivery system, we have developed policies and procedures to ensure participation of local people. We have tons of manuals, we have lots of guidance, it, we don't lack for, for tools on how to do this. But our procedures for making this happen in our procedures include household surveys, community meetings, participatory needs assessments, consultations, questionnaires, and other methods to gather the ideas and the opinions of recipient communities. We require that people demonstrate their involvement in aid by coming to meetings to discuss plans or by contributing labor or uh, time or other resources to the efforts that we undertake on their behalf. However, the vast majority of people say that they don't feel included in the critical decisions about the assistance that they receive. In their experiences, many of the decisions have been made before an aid agency arrives and there are few, if any, opportunities to add their ideas as the effort evolves. One person summarized the experience of many people in these societies with the following statement. This is how you conjugate participation. I participate, you participate, they decide. Aid recipients and providers talked about how the procedures that are intended to elicit their participation are so fully predetermined and designed by outsiders that they provide little opportunity for meaningful engagement of people in recipient communities in the decisions about the aid that they receive. As a woman in Kenya said, there should be nothing about us without us. So in a collaborative aid system, we would have collaborative decision making by aid providers and recipients. So fifth, in the externally driven aid delivery system, we focus on spending on a predetermined schedule. As a government official in Afghanistan said, the lack of flexibility and short time spans for projects creates difficult conditions. Short time approaches are one of the main factors that instigate failure. In spite of this, the donors ask for sustainability. Many aid agencies, especially those engaged in humanitarian assistance, equate efficiency with timeliness, and timeliness is often interpreted to mean speed. Aid agencies submit proposals and write reports claiming achievement of grand goals on fixed and regular schedules in brief prescribed periods. Delays are frowned upon. Late submission of reports or, uh, um, or proposals disqualifies applicants, and the late submissions of reports start at, sorry, counts as poor management. Time pressures caught eight cause aid agencies to cut corners in terms of community consultations and to make assumptions about local contexts. The pressure to deliver in short project bursts is again seen by people on the recipient end as wasteful and unrealistic. And while a business seeks rapid turnover of products, aid agencies too often seek rapid turnover of projects. As a Lebanese PhD student and consultant said, working in templates is easy, but to do it right, you need more time and money and effort. Template projects get more visibility. Some donors come with results-based frameworks with all their definitions. This is meant to be a tool for better projects, but they spend half the year explaining what it is. So in a collaborative aid system, aid providers would fit money and timing to strategy and realities on the ground. Sixth, in the, currently, in the current externally driven aid delivery system, staff are evaluated and rewarded for managing projects on time and on budget. This is a bit of a long one, but as a director of an international NGO on the Thai Burma border working in the refugee camps that have been there for many years, said, and, and she had been there for many years herself, donors demand task focused work. Staff would love to have more time to talk to people in the camp, to spend the night in the camp, but we have reports due with facts and numbers, and it needs to be right to keep the funding coming. Some NGOs are run like businesses. The donors are not helping us be respectful because they come with their new ideas, trends, and we have to jump. We end up with ridiculous time frames to do things. We cut out the process and spend the rest of the year doing damage control. When the focus of evaluations is on quantitative measures, the incentives for aid providers follow. They plan more community meetings or other events where they can count heads to demonstrate participation. Aid workers talked about how their agencies need to change the definition of what is real work with what is important work. And they discussed how aid agencies could likely get better donor support if they could define and measure engagement with more rigor and, pre and, and precision. The ways that aid agencies evaluate their staff, partners, programs, and overall impacts need to include assessments of how effectively they engage with a broad range of people and to what end. Rewards and penalties should reflect the value that aid agencies say they put on ensuring meaningful engagement of people in the aid efforts that, that are meant to support their lives. Many aid agency staff suggest the skills that they need to engage local people effectively, such as language skills, cultural sensitivity, and a collaborative approach 
need to be valued in recruiting, included in competency frameworks, and assessed in staff evaluations. As one longtime aid worker admitted in a feedback workshop, it's a carrot, but where's the stick? The stick isn't there because you're probably not going to be fired if you're good in your funding, reaching goals, and not getting relationships right. So in a collaborative aid system, staff would be evaluated and rewarded for quality of relationships and results that recipients say make lasting positive changes in their lives. So the seventh point. In the current externally driven aid delivery system, monitoring and evaluation is done by providers on project spending and delivery of planned assistance. As the director of a Lebanese NGO said, what impacts are you talking about? The impact is just spending money. Goods are delivered with no sense of social development. There's no interest to develop people, and it's all reduced to practicality. Just how to know, just to know how to write a report. The focus is on skills put into the framework of outputs with no reflection included. An efficient business keeps costs down. And NGOs and their donors mirror this practice by monitoring and emphasizing low overheads as a common measure of efficiency. But keeping, over, keeping overhead lo costs low relative to program costs is assumed to mean that an agency spends its money directly on helping people, considered the agency's outputs, rather than on headquarters salaries and offices, which are representing inputs. Whether an agency delivers tangible goods or intangible services, its reporting on deliverables is often focused on cost per quantity delivered and whether the delivery was on time. Too often the process of, of achieving, uh, of too often this is focused on the process of achieving sort of deliverables, if you will. People in communities talked about how monitoring and evaluation processes focus on what has been done in relation to these stated plans rather than on what has happened because of what was done. We heard over and over questions about why aid agencies never came back to see what had happened as a result of the assistance, not just to see if the projects were sustainable, but whether the impacts lasted and what had been the, what had been the unintended side effects, both positive and negative. Although many aid providers are concerned to know impacts and are, are asked to report on them, many say they don't really track or report on the long-term and unexpected impacts or side effects of their actions because these are hard to trace and because they're not always required for the renewal of funding. And most of the, in most cases, post-project monitoring and evaluation, much less cumulative evaluations, are not funded, particularly with today's emphasis on value for money. Both aid recipients and aid providers talked about the need to measure quality rather than quantity. And they noted that just because something is measurable does not mean that, that, it, that it is what should be assessed. As an international aid worker noted, if 10 years ago we had more solidarity but couldn't show the results, was it because we couldn't figure out how to measure it? We should ask how do local people see the changes over time? And another said, we need to say yes to mess and see that log frames are too narrow to measure many of the changes we seek to support. So in a collaborative aid system, monitoring, evaluation, and follow-up would be done by providers and recipients on the results and the long-term effects of international assistance. Last point. In the current externally driven aid delivery system, um, we are focused on growth. As the director of a local NGO in Kenya said, many people, people view interventions as a money-making business, and the humanitarian as well as the volunteer spirit that was the driving force has disappeared as most actors have become materialistic. And he was speaking a lot of local NGOs um, and the sort of aid industry in Kenya, um, which is pretty vibrant for those of you who are familiar with it. For a business, it, if delivering some is good, then delivering more is better. And donors, implementing agencies, and local partners have also come to equate success with growth. It is rare for government don governmental donors to ask their parliaments to lower aid allocations. And in turn, aid providers generally increase program requests year by year. NGOs continually try to expand their donor base and market share. Growth is taken as a measure of effectiveness, when actually it may only be an indicator of spending capability. Aid agency field directors talked about how they're promoted and respected if they grow their portfolios or their budgets every year, and they gain little recognition when they manage to save money for their aid agencies. Donors urge implementing agencies to monitor and maintain the burn rate of funds to keep on schedule. And by contrast, in many businesses, cost savings would be rewarded with bonuses. More people in aid recipient societies described aid as being too much rather than not enough. They focus on the need for smarter aid and to stop waste rather than to grow assistance. The drive to grow and to deliver more aid, while greatly appreciated in some disaster or conflict situations, 
runs counter to recipient country goals of self-reliance and donor policies to promote local ownership and sustainability. If the purpose of international assistance is to help people so that they no longer need assistance, then those providing assistance should be working to grow smaller. That is working to go out of business. So in a collaborative aid system, aid agencies would have a planned drawdown and mutually agreed exit or end of assistance strategies. Now in, in closing, in over many years we've tried many different ways to improve the ways we provide assistance. But in spite of what we think we know, people on the recipient side of aid are calling for an essential and profound shift in the international assistance paradigm. To get at what they mean, let, let's compare the theory of change behind our current aid delivery system and with the theory of change implied by a paradigm shift that people are asking for. The theory of change for our current externally driven aid delivery system is that by efficiently providing tangible and intangible in input, tangible and intangible inputs, international actors can effectively cause, catalyze, or support positive economic, social, and political change in other countries. Whether an agency delivers tangible goods or services, it's reporting on deliverables uh, sorry. Excuse me. Oops. Sorry. The theory of change of a collaborative aid, aid system may be stated that the role of international assistance in promoting positive social, political, and economic change in the countries where it is offered is to expand the range of options that people in a society can consider, to engage with them in weighing the costs and benefits of each option, and from this, to co-develop and co-implement a joint strategy for pursuing the changes that they seek. These two statements highlight the desired shift of aid recipients from a supply-driven aid delivery system that's focused on efficiency to an engaged, collaborative, mutual problem-solving process more concerned about effectiveness. Changing the complex and multi-layered system of international assistance is a huge, daunting task. And we have to ask, how it, is it, though, that we've appointed ourselves as life savers, as change agents, but we, see, we often feel so disempowered to change the system that we're a part of? It's going to take each of us deciding to approach our work and our relationships with those we mean to serve in a new way, to think long term, and to truly aim to work ourselves out of a job. Our daily routines and practices and the mechanisms that support aid must change, sometimes radically, and shifts in our thinking must be accompanied by shifts in behavior, both for aid providers and also for aid recipients. So how do we begin? Well, we can look at some of the things which are in our control. Policies, procedures, and resources are the primary instruments of international assistance. Providers of aid articulate and promulgate their ideas, principles, and, and intentions through policies. They institu institutionalize predictable measures for planning, implementing, and evaluating through procedures. And they allocate resources such as funds, goods, services, technical assistance, training, and expertise. And because we develop these tools, we can change them. And lastly, aid providers control who they hire. They define what they consider critical attributes and credentials for staff. And every, st every story of effective aid that we heard included a description of particular staff, particular people who worked in ways that developed respect and trust with aid recipients. People matter. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details today, and hopefully we can talk a bit about more about it in question and answer. There's a whole chapter on this, the closing chapter in the book, um, and I encourage you to read on it, read it and act on it. And finally, I want to thank you for listening. Um, I'm honored to have had the chance to share a few of the many voices that we've heard from people in aid recipient communities. So I'm just going to close with the words of a woman in Ecuador who was among the many who really wanted to have their voices heard. She said, thank you for listening to us and allowing us to tell you what we would like to tell those who have power over this great power that is international cooperation. <laughs>